Welcome to SS Workshop. Today we're going to have a look at the Benchtop lathe. In this series, we're going to take a look at some of the machines in the workshop, their features, and how I've modified them. Today we're looking at the lathe, which is an Optimum TU2506V. It has a 250mm swing above bed, 150mm swing over cross slide, and a 550mm distance between centres. The lathe has electronically variable speed. There's some positives and negatives that are worth discussing here. On the positives, it's really easy to change speeds. You can even change speeds while you're in the middle of turning. I previously had a belt drive lathe, and it took me 20 minutes to change the speed on it, so this is huge. It's also infinitely variable, instead of having 10 fixed gears. There's only one real negative to mention, and that's the lack of torque at low speed. That means when you're turning larger diameters, it's easy to stall the machine. The next thing to mention is the lead screw. And this lathe comes with a metric lead screw, forward and reverse, and a three-speed gearbox, along with the standard change gears. I've also upgraded the lead screw to have a cover on the front half. This really helps clean up and wear and tear, as most of the chips fall on this area of the lead screw. As you can see, otherwise you're left with an exposed lead screw like this. And given it's all nicely greased, chips love to stick to it. I managed to find the cover from China, and I just had to cut it down to fit, along with machining a couple of holders for either end, but that was all pretty straightforward. Now having a look at the carriage, we've got the hand wheel and a feed lever. The hand wheel does have backlash, as with any lathe, but it's something you've got to get used to when using a lathe. We also have the cross slide hand wheel above, and that has minimal backlash. Another upgrade I've made is this way cover to the front of the carriage. I made this out of some Vitron rubber, which is oil and heat resistant. This really helps reduce the chips on the ways, and reduces the pressure on the carriage wipers to keep these clean. Another upgrade I've made is a stop button. This allows me to hit the stop button with my knee without reaching across in front of the chuck. This really acts like the brake wood on a larger lathe. I've also extended the splash guard back. The reason for this has to do with my digital readout, which we'll get to shortly. But this provided the opportunity for a couple of other extras. A cutting oil holder, which is actually a kid's Melissa and Doug's anti spill paint container, which came in a set of four. And I'm using the rest of them around the workshop, and they're really useful, as I knock these over pretty regularly. I've also added this great little LED light, which also follows the carriage. Continuing with the upgrades, I've added this metal cover to cover the unused part of the carriage. This really aids with cleanup keeping chips out of the T-slots. I got the idea for this from one of A-Bomb79's videos, as he's got one on his big Monarch. Recently I've made this handle, which slides over the Allen key, which I use for locking the carriage. I find I use this all the time, as locking the carriage really helps with parting off. The only real reason for being able to remove it is for tailstock clearance, if you need a little bit extra reach. I've also made the plate for a full bolt top slide mounting. I just haven't got around to making the T-nuts to actually put the four bolts in yet. So it's currently only got the two original bolts on it. Apparently this is meant to make the top slide more rigid. I've also upgraded to a quick change tool post. This definitely speeds up tool changes. But if I was a beginner, this wouldn't be the first thing I'd spend my money on, as it's definitely a luxury item. If you are planning to do the quick change tool post upgrade, they usually don't fit straight out of the box. A lot of people machine their top slides to make these things fit. I was keen to keep this reversible, so what I did was machine the tool post itself, actually removed the inner centre and turned a new one and then welded it in. The original one was screwed in, but the block has been hardened so you couldn't cut a new thread in it, and this solution definitely works, I've never had any trouble with it. You may also have noticed I've got a lot of tool holders. This is purely for convenience, most beginner sets come with three or four, and it really comes down to how many tools you use regularly. Mine are all Chinese clones that I picked up from a local supplier. I also bought these over several years. Straight behind my lathe I also have drill bits. These ones are Morse taper for the tailstock, along with all my centers and drill chucks right there ready to use. I find this speeds up my workflow and if you can't see it you don't tend to use it. Another thing that's worth a mention for beginners 
You'll see me use a lot of carbide insert tool bits. There's nothing wrong with using high speed steel tool bits. They've got a lot lower upfront costs. All you gotta do is remember to keep sharpening them and not overheat the cutting edge. I've added this clipboard just above my digital readout. This really helps when you're trying to follow a set of drawings. Next up, digital readout. For an amateur machinist, backlash can be a real challenge. So can counting the revolutions of a hand wheel. So this one's definitely a game changer. This one uses glass scales, has a bunch of great features, and is a clone of a professional unit. It's definitely not necessary to jump into a unit like this, with there being some really cost effective magnetic scales that you can get. It'll just give you a simple readout. My carriage scale is located on the back of the bed, and I made an aluminium cover to protect it. For my cross slide scale, I was concerned about losing travel with my tail stock. So what I came up with was I located the scale behind the machine using the steel A-frame that you can see here. The reader is then attached to the dovetail of the top slide. I also opted for a finer resolution for the cross slide as I've opted for it to measure the diameter. To do this, the digital readout doubles the number, but this makes the steps more apparent in the resolution. Next up, let's get to work holding. This has what's called a fixed spindle nose, which means you need to unbolt four nuts to remove the chuck. If I had the option, I'd go for a quick change type in the future, but it doesn't tend to be an option for this size lathe. On chucks, I've got a selection of them. They're all 125mm diameter, and they use a permanently mounted adapter plate to fit to the spindle of the lathe. Right, let's have a look at these, starting with the three jaw self-centering chuck. This one came with the lathe and gets a lot of use. An independent four jaw chuck. These are great for odd shaped work pieces of centre turning and are actually the most accurate chucks for centering. So this obviously has to be done manually. Next on the list is a five jaw self centering chuck. These provide great support and reduce pressure on the part as it's spread over the five jaws, which means these are traditionally used with pipe where the wall could be crushed by a three jaw chuck. The chuck I use most often is this ER32 collet chuck. This is great for repeatable concentricity and I have oversized collets that will take it to 26 millimeters. The next thing to look at here is a face plate. These are great for large odd shaped items and I also use mine as a drive plate when turning between centers. While we're talking about the center, it's also worth mentioning the spindle also takes a number four Morse taper which I use when turning between centers. Another thing to look out for when buying a lathe is a spindle bore. This lathe has a 26mm spindle bore and what this means is you can put a 25mm piece of stock through the headstock. This really saves material as you can cut small parts from a larger piece of stock. The next thing to look at is the tail stock. This lathe came with a quick action tail stock locking handle and you'll often see this done as an upgrade for small lathes without this feature. The tail stock takes a number 2 Morse taper. To eject the taper when you've finished using it all you have to do is retract the pull fully and it pops out. This is a lot easier than my previous lathe where you had to tap it with a hammer to pop it out. Let's have a quick look at the MT2. Centers and hardware I've got located on the back shelf above my lathe. Starting with the center drill and spotting drill, both of which I keep in ER16 collet holders as these turned out to be cheaper than fixed holders and I got sick of swapping these in and out of a chuck. Next we've got fixed centers. This one's a half center, then we've got live centers, and this one came with a set of point adapters for various different situations. These have really got me out of a bind when trying to work hold something in the past. I also keep my chuck keys right in front of me, and that makes sure they're always back in place before I start the lathe. Hopefully this has given you a bit of an insight into the lathe I used and the tooling. On an upcoming episode, I'll take a look at the benchtop mill, so don't forget to subscribe if you want to catch that. Also, if you're new to this channel and you want to see the lathe in action, check out my series The Fill Engine Project, where I'm building a 3.5 inch gauge 5 steam locomotive to my own drawings. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and share it with a friend. Catch you next time.